I'm David Eastwood with Geotech Engineering and Testing, and I'll be talking to you guys about this recommended guidelines for design and construction of swimming pools in Texas. Um, it's hot, it's time for swimming, going to the pool. Um, Geotech uh, has been around for about 37 years. We do geotechnical, environmental materials, and geoforensic studies. We've got a staff of 60 engineers. We work all over Texas, Louisiana, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. And we have all rigs so we can get out there, get your jobs quickly done. Audience makeup, we got about 100 people. And we've got a lot of engineers. We've got some pool builders, a few attorneys. So we've got a lot of people, different background. We've got people from some of the cities around Texas. If you need to reach me, uh, my email is de at geotechieng.com. And my phone number is 713-699-4000. Uh, see. Okay, this presentation is going to be on YouTube. So if, if you want to, if you miss it for some reason or you want to watch it again, because a lot of times people want to watch this several times. Um, you go to YouTube uh, channel, the Geotech Engineering, and you can watch it. So that's where it's going to be. There are other programs on YouTube. You can watch that and send us an email. We can give you a certificate for watching it. If you have questions, please uh, type the questions in the Q&A section of this presentation. You know, pools come in many shapes and forms. Uh, you know, we, all over Texas, we're looking at the pools, and there's a lot of great pool builders and landscape architects that come up with pools. Some of them get fancy with this rock on the side. Yeah, pools on slopes. Here's the pool right there. It's going to crack over here if you got expansive soils. There's another pool. Pool with rock. Indoor pools. Lab pools. Apartment complex pools. And that city of Houston pool out there downtown. Natatoriums. This is the largest pools in the world. That's in Chile. Uh, in south coast of Chile. One billion dollars to construct it. A lot of hotels. Big pool there. It's a pool coming out of the ground due to hydrostatic pressure. Here's another one coming out of the ground due to hydrostatic pressure. This one's coming out of the ground almost, you know, 16, 14 inches. Here's a crack in the flat work. More cracks in the flat work. Joints that are opening up into brick. It's another pool that's cracking up. Highly expansive soils. A lot of cracks in the joints. This is what we call vanishing edge pool in Memorial, Houston. Yeah, next built in the Buffalo Bayou, there's a 40 foot drop over here and the edge of the pool cracked and separated and start dropping. Uh, we have cracks in the plaster and gunite. Here's a pool in Friendswood. That's cracked up. <laughs> See the gunite all cracked up over here. 
bad gunite. We see a lot of bad gunite in pool construction. See again, the plaster cracked, leaking, cracks out there in the gunite. Yeah, it's a, another pool there. Car in the pool. Pools on slopes. You gotta really design pools on slopes, otherwise they start creeping and falling. We see a lot of pools on the sl slopes that are creeping and uh, have problems. This is a pool in Tanglewood near Houston, in Houston. And you can see that uh, the pool is coming up on this side. The pools come up usually if you got expansive soils, they come out on the on the shallow ends, they come up. This is a pool in Friendswood. This is one side of it. Here's the other side of it, it's coming up. It's a pool in West University. And, and you can see it's coming up on this side. Yeah, it's moving up over here. Um, pool design and construction should be always considered the effects of soils, groundwater, structural connection, structural connect, uh, concerns, drainage, trees, slopes. Design, American national standards for in-ground swimming pool design. It really doesn't address anything that has to do with soils. And, you know, it says the structural design materials used shall be in accordance with generally accepted structural engineering properties and methods. He doesn't say anything. This uh, presentation is pool design recommendations and applicable to expansive soils where you have expansive soils. So if you want to do a pool, the first thing we do is uh, we do the soil test for it. We do field exploration. This is our building and these are our rigs. We got rig, this goes 150 feet, 120 feet deep. These goes about 20 feet deep. These are ATVs. These are portable rigs right there. They go in backyard and in the woods. So if you're building a pool over here, we use a truck manor rig, you go out there and do the borings. This is a portable rig moves down to about 20 feet deep. That's all we need, 20 feet. In Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, we go 25. But in Houston, we go 20 feet deep. Uh, we do the pools, soil testing next to the biggest trees. Trees tell us a lot about expansive soils. So we get root fibers at the trees. That's very important in your design of the pools. So we do the borings next to the trees. You get soil samples. Most of the samples are taken with a Shelby tube sampler. These are three inch diameter tubes are three inches in diameter and hollow, about three foot long. That's how you get a soil sample. You cut the ends of the soil sample, give it a job number, put it in a wax box. You got to test it right away, otherwise it's going to go bad. One of the things we look for when we do these things is we look for root fibers. Root fibers in soils from trees extend to the area where there is oxygen and water. When it stops, um, that indicates that the active zone depth at which the soil experiences shrink and swell uh, stops. So if you got your root fiber at 10 feet, your active zone depth is 12 foot. It's two foot below the lowest root fiber. If it's 20 foot deep, it's about 22 foot. So that's the zone at which the soil is subject to movement. That doesn't mean that's going to move all the way down. So like in Houston, you, you're limited to movement only 10 feet. In Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, you're limited to movements about 15 feet. Again, you can see the root fiber here. In areas where soils are sandy, we cannot get Shelby tube sampler and push it into the soil because sands are too hard. So we get 140 pound hammer, you drop it 30 inches. And you can see that it's a 140 pound hammer. You drop it 30 inches to run a standard penetration test. You drive in 18 inches into the ground, six inch, six inch, six inch. 
called standard penetration test. This is the uh, sample of the soil split spoon. You split it, split spoon. So if your blow counts for the top 12 inches of the SPT is zero four, you got very loose soil. So it's like you're in Bridgeland or Woodlands area. Loose, five to 10 blows per foot. Medium dense, 11 to 30. Dense, 31 to 50. Very dense. You got to be out there in Loving County, out there near New Mexico to get that kind of a, a high blow counts near the surface. It's 140 pounds, dropping 30 inches. If you start going deeper, you're going to hit rock. So we're doing pool jobs in Austin where we hit pool uh, rock at five feet. In Houston area, rock is about 2,500 foot deep. So you're not going to hit rock. But if you go out there on 105 west of Conroe, you're going to start hitting sandstone out there. If you go to Hunts Huntsville, you're going to hit some hand sandstone. This is in Austin. It's Austin Chalk. So that's where we hit rock. We measure the water level. Water level fluctuates. So if your water level in the summertime is 15 feet, 20 feet, in you know, in wintertime in February, it can be only eight feet. So the water table that's in the soil report depends on when the soil report was done. And so you cannot count on that water table information unless you know you put a piezometer in the ground that monitors your groundwater for a while, and then from that you can establish the you know the lowest depth. The way you measure a model table, you got to wait tight to the end of the ta ta tape. You throw it in a hole. When it goes plump, you hit the water table. Number of borings. For a pool less than 3,000 square foot, you got to do two borings 20 feet deep in Houston, 225s in Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. If your pool bigger than that, for any, every additional 1,500 square foot, you got to do additional boring. 20 feet in Houston and 25 feet in Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. Laboratory testing. One of the simplest tests we do out there for soil testing, trying to you know, classify the soil is called liquid limit test. In this test, we try to find out how much water we should add to the soil for it to behave liquid. It's called liquid limit test. So we get this cup, you fill it up with soil, you add a bunch of water to it, and when it comes liquid, you take it, you put it in this cup in here, you cut a groove through it with this, turn this handle 20, 30 times. Uh, when it comes together, you get a wet sample of it. You get a wet weight of it. You wanna know how much weight the soil weighs when it's wet. And um, then you put it in the oven and dry it up and get a dry weight of it. You wanna know, so you get a moisture content, how much it weighs when it's dry, so, so the difference between the wet weight and the dry weight is how much water is in that soil. Another test we do in the laboratory is called plastic limit test. With this test, we roll the sample to one eighth of an inch and you take the wet weight of it, you put it in the oven and you get a dry weight of it. So the difference between the dry and wet is how much water is in the soil to behave semi-plastic condition, kind of a dry soil, okay? Soils below plastic limit is, you know, usually drier, dry soils. The difference between liquid limit and plastic limit, if you subtract the liquid limit more than from, sub from a plastic limit is plasticity index. So if your liquid limit is 60 and PI plastic, uh, and uh, your plastic limit is 30, your PI is 30. So you got the soil with the PI of 30, you got moderately expansive soils. Soils between 30 and 40 are high, Above 40 is very high. Be less than 20 is low soil potential. A couple of other tests that's important that you do in the laboratory are hand penetrometer and a torrain. Uh, in a hand penetrometer, you push this into the soil and read here what kind of strength it has. Here, you got the torrain. You put it at the end of the soil sample. You push it in. You turn it in torsion, and you can read what kind of strength it has. You can do also unconfined compression tests. In this test, you got a proving ring, you got deflection, you crush the soil, 
see what kind of a strength it has. You use these values in your pool design for your excavations and lateral pressures on the pool. So that's, you need this data. Soil types. In Texas, we have a lot of highly plastic soils. We call it gumbo clays. This is a clay site. In some areas, if you go to Galveston, you got sandy soils, like a beach sand. It's a sandy site. You got areas that are silty. Like if you go out there near the Woodlands, Bridgeland area, 249, Katy. There's a lot of uh, silt, hard material to build on. The grain size of the silt is bigger than clay, but it's smaller than sand. It's not a good material to build on. So we have clay. You go deeper, it becomes orange clay. You go deeper, you got white clay. You go deeper, you get into weathered rock. Then you go deeper, you hit rock. This is sandstone uh, west of April Sound on near Lake Conroe. So you got sandstone there. You go to Huntsville, you're going to hit sandstone. That's the rock cores, put them in the box, you take it to the lab to test, fill. We build some pools in the fill. Fill is engineered soil. Basically, as long as it's properly compacted to 95% in standard proctor density, and it doesn't have organics, uh, you can use it for, the, for putting a pool in it. So it's called structural fill. So if you go around Houston, we start from where I live, which is near Roman Forest. Uh, you got real sandy soils over here. You go to Kingwood, parts of Kingwood is really sandy. Parts of Kingwood is really expansive soils. A lot of pools move up and down. Go to Tascacita. You got sandy soils over clay, a lot of movement. Highland, Baytown, La Porte, Pasadena. South Houston, Pearland, Seabrook, League City, Dickinson, Sugarland, Missouri City, Rosenberg, all these areas, you got highly expansive soils. A lot of movement. You go to uh, Katy, you're going to hit Cinco Ranch, you'll be good. Your soils are sandy with low PI. Start going to Bridgeland, your soils are sandy with low PI. Fairfield, the same, sandy soils. You go to Tomball, you're going to hit some gumbo clay, some areas, and some areas are going to hit real sandy soils. You go to the woodlands, you got mostly sandy soils, but, you know, they're moderately expansive soils. You go near Westview, Bel Air, Tanglewood, you got highly expansive soils, big oak trees that cause movement, and a bunch of attorneys. So you watch out. These are the soils, expansive soils that shrink during the summertime, develop what's called shrinkage cracks. With time, these get these cracks get filled up with soil and debris. And then when it rains, they want to heave up. Uh, they want to swell up because they get moisture. They don't have any place to go because the cracks are already filled with debris. So they crack out there at 45 degrees. They call them slick insides. So if you dig a pool, you see the side of the pool collapsing all of a sudden. One of the reasons could be because of presence of these slick insides. In your soils, these are cracks that's been there for a long time, and uh, you start digging a pool, and then the side, whole side drops out. Engineering analysis. If you look at Texas, the red area is where all the expansive soils are. This is Texas and Louisiana. We've got expansive soils. These are the soils that they basically can expand up to 1,500% by U.S. Corps of Engineers. So this is a lot of expansive soils around the tech in the U.S. The soils of Texas are variable, so it's very important every time we do a pool, a residential structure, or a commercial project, or a roadway, make sure you know your soils. Organics, the red areas where the expansive soils are in Texas and Louisiana. You know, Dallas-Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston, they all are located in areas where we have a lot of expansive soils. North of Buffalo's, Buffalo Bayou, we got sandy soils. South of Buffalo Bayou, we got Beaumont Formation, which is expansive soils. 
geotechnical design information. Um, in a geotechnical report for pools, and again, there's a pool report. You cannot use a soil report for a foundation for a house for pool design. You need to get a pool report. Uh, the, the pool report should include site conditions, photos, plan of borings, soil stratigraphy, groundwater depth, whether or not soils are expansive, lateral pressures against the pool, OSHA soil classifications, laboratory tests, skin friction along the pool to resist buoyancy forces, recommendations on compressive and uplift capacity of drill piers, dewatering recommendations, PVR at the shallow end and deep end, ed edge moisture distance, um, depth of active zone, depth of uh, root fibers, uh, are the trees near the pool within the 50 feet, tree trunks and species, what kind of a trees out there? Are they elm or are they oak or they willow? Recommendations on uplift resistance techniques, whether or not the excavated soils can be used as fill, maintenance programs, trees, drainage, construction considerations. So these are the stuff gotta be in the soil report. One of the important information that we need to have in our soil report is called potential vertical rise or PVR. Expressed in inches is the potential ability of the soil material to swell and shrink at a given density, moisture, and loading conditions. So PVR for most pools should be less than to half an inch. When you would start moving more than an inch or so in the pool, then you, you know, you have a risk of tripping and all kinds of stuff. Uh, so we like to have them keep it to about less than half an inch. This is what we call PVR map of Houston that I developed. So if you go to spring, your potential vertical rise 1.5 inches, Tomball one to four inches. You go out there and Katy is one and a half inch. Full share is two to four inches. Richmond is about five inches. Great Wood is about six inches. If you go out here to Texas City, you can have as much as eight inches of PVR. You go out here to Webster, League City, about five, six inches. Mall Bellevue, about five, six inches. You go inner city out here in Bel Air, West U, Tanglewood, you have anywhere between four to six inches of uh, PVR movement. One of the other things we need to describe in our report, in a pool report, is edge moisture distance. We assume uh, edge moisture distance of about nine feet in Texas. That's how you come up with your design for your pool. And so knowing the, the edge moisture distance tells you how much moisture can travel underneath your flat work. One of the things that we're concerned about is the active zone. We have two types of active zone, moisture active zone, and then we have basically moisture inactive active zone. The other thing we have is the movement active zone. The active zone near trees is deeper because it sucks more moisture. So for a pool, you can have a moisture active zone of about, let's say 20 feet, but your movement active zone is only 10 feet in Houston, 15 feet in Dallas, San Antonio and Austin. So depth of movement active zone in Houston is 10 feet. Dallas, Austin, San Antonio is 15 feet. So when you do a soil test, you give that to a structural engineer to do the pool design. You gotta find a structural engineer that knows how to do pools. If the guy is a petrochemical guy, he doesn't know how to do pools. So you gotta get a pool guy that's got experience. Structural engineer should be licensed in Texas, must review the pool report. You have to have a pool report. You can have a, use the foundation report to come up with the pool design. Must consider lateral pressures, buoyancy, expansive soils, affects a tree removal or tree dying because trees die next to pools and that causes heat. Evaluate up uplift resistance of the pool due to expansive soils. Develop plans and specification for earthwork, gunite, drainage, stair reinforcement. Structural engineers should discuss potential pool movement and foundation alternative with the owner. 
owner will make the decision as to what type of foundation he wants for his pool, depending on the risk. This is the typical soil boring logs that we show. This is a fat gumbo clay all the way from zero to about 13 feet. You got a PI of 59 and 51, the strength of about 1,500 PSF. Below that, you got non-expansive soils. Below that, you got fat clay again. Initially, we hit the water at 14 feet and jumped to about 12 feet. You probably will go up higher with time. Pool distance from existing structures. A lot of people like to put the pools next to their foundation. The gunite leaks and causes foundation movement. And what we like to see if the pools are at least nine feet away from your foundation. So if you go out there and you put a pool right next to the foundation of a house, uh, you're asking for trouble. Pool foundations, um, one of the best type of foundation you can use is called structural pools and void, void, void spaces. You basically have a pool, you put it on deep piers and you put void boxes around the pool. These are the void boxes. Basically, uh, the uh, for the, the, the this um, structural pool on void boxes. Uh, you support the the pool on, on drill piers or helical piles. You put voidable void boxes around it. Basically, the the size of the void box is twice the size of the PVR. And, and uh, since the expansive source shrinks swell in three dimensions, put the void boxes against the pool walls. And then to prevent water infiltration, you put 18 inches of uh, structural fill on top of the, 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 the existing soils. The geotechnical engineers should provide recommendations on both compressive and uplift capacity of the drill puddings or helical piles. These are void boxes. That's where the piers are going. That's the pier. Here's a void box. See the void box. You put them in the gray beams and on the on top underneath the pool. These are your piers. Gray beams pool. Put void boxes here. Here's another pool here with void boxes. That's the great beam. Start pumping the concrete here. This is a pool in here. See void boxes all around. Now this is the piers, which put void boxes underneath it on the sides as well. Void boxes here, void boxes here. This is a structural pool. Void boxes, void boxes, drill pier. Pools on helical piles. Again, instead of piers, you can use helical piles. You still got to use the void boxes. Here's they're putting the helical piles in there. Putting the helical piles like that. This is the pool, <coughs> yeah, like Condro. They got expansive soils. These are void boxes. You drill the hillock piles. Got like that. So the hillock piles just screw them in there. They're a good foundation. Then you set the forms, put your grade beams in.
put in your void boxes, cover them up, keep it from penetration, put your steel in, start doing a shot creek. These are hill piles. These are the bars, the stems on the hill piles, the extension sections. You just screw them into the ground. These are hill piles, void boxes. Hill piles, void boxes. Just screw them into the ground. Floating pool system, that's another pool. So we talked about the structural pool. Now this is a floating pool. You can use it if the soils are non-expansive, for example. Floating pool, subsoil removal and replacement. So uh, you can remove all the expansive soils to a distance equal to the edge moisture distance. And then you take out the soils uh, to the area, what we call the movement active zone. So the way you determine the active zone, of course, is two foot below the lowest root fiber. Your movement active zone in Houston is about uh, 10 foot deep. And uh, in Dallas, San Antonio and Austin is 15 feet. And then you got structural fill that you need to put in. The backfill with structural fill with select structural fill with liquid limit less than 40 and PI between 12 and 20. Compact in eight inch lifts, standard proctor density at moisture content plus or minus 2%. So um, set forms, you can do cat, cast in place forms. So what you do, you go out there and take out all the expansive soils, nine feet away from the pool to a depth of 10 to 15 feet, 10 foot in Houston, 15 feet in Dallas, San Antonio and Austin. The distance of nine feet. This is the top view. You can see the new soils. You put select structural fill that's not expansive. You put it over here and then you go set forms or you dig out a new pool in here and you fill it with the gunite. So you remove the expansive soils, backfill it with select structural fill. Or you can do the cheapest method, which would be the chemical stabilization. So you got this tank over here. Uh, you got chemicals in it, like sulfuric acid type stuff. This is a clay particle. It's got lots of water in it. Highly expansive soils absorb water. When you do the chemical injection, it reduces this layer, it makes the soils less negative, the, the clay platelets, and doesn't want to absorb as much water. It re reduces, uh, removes sodium and potassium and put calcium in it. It's called cation exchange. So when you do a pool, you can mark it, the areas, you know, like two foot spacing. Then they go out there and do chemical injection. You go down to a depth of 10 feet in Houston, 15 feet to Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, or to top of the rock. Also, you do that the same thing with the flat work. You know, your flat work active zone is still the same. So if you don't want your flat work to, to move, you got to do chemical injection of your flat work as well. See the pool in here doing chemical injection. This is an existing pool that's moving. You do chemical injections around it and in it. This is a device that you use. You could use a dozer with this device. It connected to a hose. It's got the chemicals that shoots through these holes. They're like two foot apart. You inject it into the soil. And you know, typically these chemicals come out and uh, you go at like every foot intervals. Or as you go down, you a depth of 10 feet in Houston, 15 feet in Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas. If your soil's all cracked up, more chemicals want to get around because the chemicals can go through the cracks everywhere. 
So soils with a lot of cracks are better soils for chemical injection. Here we call injection depth, Houston 10 foot, San Antonio and Austin 15 foot. Pool leak, pools do leak, gunite leaks. So if you put a pool next to a house, if it leaks, it can cause foundation movement. Cracks through the gunite in plaster can cause leak. All these cracks can leak into the expansive soils. And if they leak, that pool starts, starts moving in the expansive soils. Pool plumbing, you got to make sure you got good pool plumbing, nice and organized. Uh, we don't want to have leaks up in the plumbing. This is not a good plumbing. Really a pool construction. Structural pool on a slope. We get a lot of calls. Oh, I'm putting this pool in, on Lake Condro, you know, or right on top of a slope somewhere. You got a slope, you got to design your pool for the slope. You put the pool in deep, deep piers to keep it from basically falling into the river or a slope. This is a slip circle. Put the pool with a retaining wall there. That's your slip circle. Obviously, it's a better system. You only use this system with deep piers if the slopes are relatively stable. If there are potential for slope failure, you're going to put your pool behind the retaining wall. Here's a pool failure on a slope. That's a pool out there uh, near Memorial, a vanishing edge pool, 40 foot drop. The edge of the pool cracks and separates. Uh, question, uh, what type of retaining walls beneath the pool on a slope? You can have what we call soldier pile, drill shaft wall. That's a great, good one to have. Uh, you can also have uh, sheet pile wall. Uh, uh, if you're doing a block wall, you got to make sure it's properly designed because we see a lot of these block walls are failing. So you got to have to have to make sure you got granule back backfill behind those walls. Don't go out there and put block walls in, in clay soils. They're not good. So make sure you excavate behind the wall and put all your strips on the block wall in granule material like gravel. They got specifications in the block walls system design manual about what you should put behind the wall. We see some of these block walls are failing in, in expansive soils. Here are the cracks out there in the gunite and plaster area. Pools and bulkheads. And this is sugar lead. They want to put this bulkhead here and they want to put a pool behind it. So if this is an anchored bulkhead, you got to have to have that pool outside the anchor zone. So you can't do that. They're putting the pools in here and there's a bulkhead here. This pool should be outside the anchor zone. So if this is your pool, it's your bulkhead. This is your pool, this is your bulkhead. This is your anchor zone, this anchor. 
The pool should be outside this area. You can't put a pool here. You got to put it here. Pool bottom, as you excavate the pool soils, got to be nice and hard and compact. No loose material. Nice and compact. If there's water coming out, if it's clay soils, you pump it out. If it's sand, you have to do dewatering to get that water three feet below bottom of the pool. Pool walls, they got to be nice, clean, no loose materials. These pools are subject to expansive soils loading, buoyancy forces, lateral pressures, uplift. So you got to design your shell on the pool to resist all these loads. A lot of people don't do that. If you have rock here, make sure you put this rock on deep foundation like piers. That's a lot of load there. All this over here may have to be on piers. If you got parts of the pool caving in, you can do what's called flash. At Shock Creek, you put a fly on top of the soil to keep it from caving after excavation and putting steel placement. That's how you do flashing. Back feet, back feet behind the pool walls. If you got a set in the form and you put a pool in, you want a backfill with sand around it because sand is less expansive and it's got a low lateral pressure. Then you put, you know, here's another pool here. Set the form. Then after you put the sand in, you put 18 inches of select structural fill on top of it to minimize water intrusion behind the wall of the pool. So you put 18 inches of soil on top of it. This is the fill behind the wall. Use a, use a structural fill to backfill it. Buoyancy forces. Uh, if you got high hydrostatic pressures that push your pool out of the ground. This is a pool in West U. They wanted to, you know, clean it uh, on a weekend. So to take the water out, it rains, the, the pool starts shooting up 15 inches. The Suda Insurance Company and uh, the insurance company, they didn't pay them. They said, uh, basically, the, the pool is still safe, sanitary, and livable. And they did not pay them. If you want to kind of empty a pool, do maintenance work on it, you're going to have to punch some holes in the bottom of it to relieve hydrostatic pressure. Otherwise, it may come up to resist buoyancy forces. Uh, you're going to have to extend the bottom of the pool behind the pool wall to create a tow and to provide sufficient weight overburden. Increase the mass of the bottom of the pool using gunite or concrete, or you can use drill piers and they resist the uplift by drill piers or helical piles. So if you got expansive soils and you want to resist uplift, these are some of the things you can do. So if you got a pool here, you got expansive soils, or you want to resist hydrostatic forces, really, uh, you, you make this thicker or extend it out to resist uplift due to buoyancy forces. French drains around the pool. Some contractors, they go in there and they want to put, put the gunite in here. Below that, they put gravel. And then uh, they put this Inca map deal for drainage. I then put a plastic sheet here. And then they pump the water out from here. Put a sump pump there. This is not a very effective uh, design in expansive soils. If your soil is sandy, you can do that. But you cannot use gravel here and then sump pump in expansive soils. Your soil, will, your pool will still experience heave. Affect the trees on pools. Trees affect pools a lot. 
these root systems and stuff that affect pools. These are trees kind of falling off. Got roots that are coming out. Root systems grow three dimensions. This concept is applicable to residential and commercial projects for pools and foundation for buildings as well. Yeah, you can see the root systems growing three dimensional. This is my house. You can see the pool coming right through it. It's my vacation house. My condo in Florida. This is a pool out there. It's a pool. Another pool. I mean, it's a tree house with the kids. It's a tree hugger. Again, people like pool trees around pools. But if these trees die, these pools gonna heave up. So you gotta design for that. Again, you can see these oak trees next to this pool. When they die, you're gonna have to. These pools gonna heave up. You put the pool trees away from the pools as much as you can. You would like them to be at least twenty feet away from the pool, preferably more than that. Basically, put the put the trees at least equal to their height, future height from a from a pool, or from a foundation. Make sure you put the pool trees away from the pools. Root heave. Uh, one of the ways that the trees affect pools and foundation is heave. Basically, we'll call root heave. Their roots go underneath the, the, the structure and lift them up and crack them. It's they're lifting the wall in here. They're lifting the sidewalk here. See the roots going out there, lifting the sidewalk. It's the willow tree. The, the floor slab on this house had heaved up. We dug a hole there. It was a one inch root there going underneath the slab, lifting it up. This is a house in the woodlands area. It's a pine tree. The floor slab in the bedroom had come up. They jackhammered that and they found the roots there underneath the, the floor slabs. So root systems can go underneath the structure and lift them. It's called root heave. These are the roots underneath the floor slabs. They try to get out there and get moisture. That can get underneath the pool and lift up the pool. See the root system? Here are the root systems. You have to take them out. You take them out. You jump and jack this area. And you put the vapor barrier. Put steel on it, put concrete. Here's the root systems going underneath the coping, trying to lift up the pool. Soil heave due to tree removal. If you got to build a pool here in West University, you got this big old tree here, you're going to take it out. This tree has been sucking moisture from that soil for years. So the soil is pretty dry. So when you cut it out, the soil wants to rehydrate, get, get to what we call suction equilibrium. As it does that, it starts heaving. Areas that got high, you know, heavily wooded sites, they cut all these trees and then put houses in them. If your soils are expansive, all these houses are subject to movement unless you design for them. This tree here, when it dies or when you remove it, this pool can move unless it's designed for it. If there's a pool here, when these trees die, that pool is gonna move. It's a neighbor's property, but the pools of course don't know anything about property line. These root systems suck water and moisture from soils. When you cut them with time, 
the soil rehydrates and causes heave. This is a building. The, the, the tree was taken out near point H. And this point F, that's far. Point H kind of heaved up after you cut the tree out and expanse the soils. And he still heaved up to almost 30 years. He moved up about 6.3 inches. Point F moved about 20 millimeters, which is about one inch. The farther from the tree you are, the less movement you're going to get. So when you cut a tree or a tree dies, that ground is going to heave up. You got to design the pool for that condition. So if you got this oak tree here, it's been around 400 years. This is a zone of moisture removal underneath the pool. It goes all the way to 10 feet, it's all ducted. The soil moisture is removed due to trees. This is 2H, twice the height of the tree. So if your tree is 100, uh, 50 foot tall, a distance of 100 foot away from the tree, moisture is removed. So that's the moisture removal zone. This is where the tree is, so depth of 10 feet, twice the height. If you put a pool in this zone, this soil is really dry, it wants to rehydrate. You got to design it so that it doesn't heave, which the way you design it is A, you can do a structural pool, you can do removal and replacement, or you can do chemical injection. Basically, uh, the root spread is bigger than drip line of the tree. This is in Austin. There's a house there in Austin. Uh, the soil had a PI between 50 and 60. They cut those trees in the back. In the back of the house here, heaved up about 8.2 inches. That's how the soil wanted to rehydrate. And M did a bunch of research. You take out a tree out on the ground. The first year, the soil rehydrates to about 44%. It takes five years for it to get 100% rehydrated if there's a lot of moisture available. So if you want to build a house or a pool or a commercial structure, you got to watch out, design it for this rehydration if you cut a tree in expansive soils. Soil shrinkage due to uh, moisture removal. If you got oak trees and you put, on, put a building here or a pool, the root systems from these trees will suck the moisture from underneath the building and cause sediments on the edge. So the whole side of the, uh, the, the building slopes towards the trees. As they get closer to the trees, the slope becomes bigger. There's a crack here. More cracks, slopes this way. University of Texas at Arlington did research. They said, if you got tree here, the D distance from the tree to a house or a pool, H is future height of the tree. A D or H of one, you can have as much as 0.2 feet of shrinkage. That's 2.4 inches. So these roots here will suck out the moisture all the way down in here. These are risks of the different types of uh, trees. Oak trees, you want to put them one H away from, from a pool or a house. Poplar tree, you want to put them one H. H is the future height of the tree. So if in the future your tree is 50 feet tall, you want to put them at least 50 feet away. So uh, you can go willow tree, 1H, plain, 0.5H, lime, 0.5H, beech, 0.5, birch, 0.5H, Cypress, 0.5H. So that was kind of a presentation trees from hell. Some measures to prevent tree distance, distress. You put the trees as far away from a pool as you can. Create depressions around the pool. 
so the water can go in there and keep the roots from spreading. They can get moisture right there. Put in sprinkler systems, pond the pools and moisture barriers. So the root systems go downward, not laterally. We like this moisture barrier to be about 48 inches deep. You can also put in bio barriers. These are herbicide pills, root systems hit them, stuns them, they don't go past that. They last about 10 years. After that, they're no good. Put pots around the building or the pool. Put pots in. Planter areas, if you got a pool, you got the planter area here and flat work over here. This area stays wet and this side of the pool is gonna move up and down, causing cracking and expansive soils. So you gotta know how the landscaping should be around the pool. This area is wet, cause this side of the pool to move. Again, if you got a pool, this area is all flat work. This area is planter, this area is planter. The pool is going to be subject to movement due to the moisture from the planter areas. This pool here, you got expansive soils here, narrow structure here. You're going to have heave here and this part of the pool is going to crack. This is a pool in West University. They went in there, put gravel all around it, highly expansive soils, trees. It's a floating pool. They got a bed liner with gravel, saturate the soils behind the pool. Pool experiences movement and cracking. Separations on the tiles. So the construction, considerations, pool excavations. You have to mark the pool area, get a backhoe to excavate it. Once you excavate it, it's gotta be a nice and clean excavation. Groundwater control, if you hear water, you got clay soils, you pump it out, the sump pump. If you're sandy soils, you put well points. These well points can go about, you know, 12, 20 feet deep. You bought about eight to 12 foot of spacing. You got to reduce the water depth here to about three feet below the bottom of the bottom excavation. So if your excavation is 20 feet or 15 feet on a pool, you got to take out water all the way down to 18 feet when you do construction. This is an indoor pool in the Memorial Hospital. They wanted to clean the pool. They put in a dewatering system. This is a pump, suck the moisture out, the water out. Flat work. If you got expansive soils, you're gonna have to treat the soils underneath the flat work. Otherwise they move and crack. There are all types of flat work, the concrete type, This is a concrete. You put the joint spacing about eight, 12 foot apart. You don't put a bunch of expansion joints in there. You want control joints. Here's the pool, flat work. Pool, flat work. Pull the concrete, finish it. As soon as you finish it, you go in there and put your control joints in. 
you put the control joints eight to 12 foot apart. Flat, flagstone, flat work. If you got expansive soils, these flagstones crack. I don't recommend flagstone. They look nice, but they crack. Keep control joints spacing to twice flat work thickness in feet. So if your flat work is five inches thick or four, four inches thick, your, your, your control joints got to be at least, they got to be at eight foot spacing. This is an expansion joint. You don't want expansion joints, maybe one on each side. That's all you need. The rest of it got to be control joints. With expansion joints, this wood is going to deteriorate. Create the pathway for water to get in there and cause heave on your pool. If the wood is deteriorating, you're going to have to put joint fill in it immediately. Don't let this thing just stays bare. The joint spacing should be twice the thickness of the flat work. If your flat work is four inches, this distance should be 12 feet. Again, four inch flat work, this distance should be about 12 feet. Again, you can see the expansion joint in here. This is the control joint. You saw cut it one fourth of the thickness of the paving. Cut it like that. You cut it like that. So if you're four four inches thick, you sock out one inch. It tells the concrete where to crack below it. You usually put it in four to uh, twelve hours after you pour the concrete, eight to twelve hours. Otherwise, it's going to get cracking. It's a crack there, separation, cracks, drill piers. If you put the pool on piers, uh, you drill a hole in the ground, you got, this is a reamer. You put the piers in the ground, usually about 18, 20 foot deep. If you got expansive soils, You make sure you got the proper depth, put a tape measure in it. Check a hand penetrometer, see if the soils are strong enough for the compressive loads. Use a <coughs> reamer tool. You put it in there and you sweep it, make sure you got the bell. A lot of times the people don't put the right size bell in there. Yeah, somebody's asking me, can you repeat the control joint spacing to the flat work? It's twice the thickness of the concrete. So if your concrete is four inches, your, your flat work is uh, eight feet spacing, twice of it in feet. Again, you can uh, put the bell tool in there, make sure you got the bell. Make sure the bottom is clean. Put your steel cage in. Pour concrete, make sure it doesn't hit the sides. So to put a pier in, you drill a hole in dry method. And then you put a cage in there. You, If you need a bell, you put a bell in here. You know, we're gonna need that, you know, so what you have in here is you drill it, you put the cage in, you trim the concrete from top to the bottom. Hilka piles. Again, you can put the, uh, the pool on Hilka piles. This is the stem, you screw it in, it's pretty quick. This is a Hilka pile system. It really resists both uh, compressive strength and, and also uplift. Drainage, you want to have positive drainage away from the pool. You don't want the water draining towards the pool. You want to make sure it's away, going away from the pool. You want to have positive drainage away from the pool. 
positive drainage. You can use channel drains, but they usually get clogged up and they're not very effective. You got to take them out and clean them, put them back in. Channel drains, also called trench drains, as gutters, perimeter, drain the large volumes of sheet flow. They uh, eliminate the need for uh, surface water, low airing, low, low lying area. So, but then you require kind of going out there and cleaning it every once in a while, maintaining it. Quality control earthwork. You got to compaction the soils underneath the pool and in the flat work. You can use a still drum roller, small one, compact it. In the area of the plumbing, you can use the jump and jack to make sure everything is compact. Run density tests with a nuclear gauge to make sure all the fill placement and the soil is properly compacted. Steel <coughs> observations, you gotta make sure you got proper placement of the steel spacing and make sure you got chairs, so steel spacing. I don't like this chair as you put a real plastic chairs in there. You measure the spacing of the steel. It's a big deal here at Gunite Shot Creek. Mortar or concrete that's pneumatically projected to the surface at high velocity. If it's dry and add water to it when you shoot it, it's called gunite. If it's wet pro pro mixed prior to placement, it's called shot creek. I like shot creek better than gunite. Uh, it's basically a mixture of a cement and aggregate with an aggregate size of no, no bigger than 0.75 inches. Here's the gunite, they add water to it here with the valve. This guy gotta know what he's doing, otherwise he's gonna develop voids. They have been doing this for a long time. Again, this is the gunite truck. Come in here and mix it. It's basically sand and gravel and cement. You shoot it in, this is how you add water. You're shooting it. This is the water. This is gunite. If you put the gunite in two in two applications, you develop cold joints. Don't do that. You got to put that gunite in one time. So you can't have a cold joint there. You get a lot of cracking if you have cool joints. When you put your pool in, you leave some holes in here to relieve the hydrostatic pressure because there's no water in here right now. So you leave your holes in there to relieve the hydrostatic pressure. Construction testing, ACI 506. You make four cylinders or cubes every 50 yards on your gunite or shot creek. These are the cylinders. There are four by eight, four inch diameter, eight inch height. You, you put, uh, cap them, and you put them in a machine and you crack them. Most gunites should be 4,000 PSI at 28 days. We find out that's not true. A lot of these gunites are bad. You gotta make sure you test them. These are the cube gunite samples. You put them in a machine and you break them. Got to be 4,000 PSI at 28 days. If the temperature is hot, do not put in gunite at temperatures above 90 degrees wet mix and 100 degrees for dry methods. Lower the temperature of the steel surface to 100, below 100 degrees prior to shot creaking. Sh shooting may Proceed if the temperature is 40 degrees and higher or 50 degrees for latex modified shot creek. Do not start if the temperature is 40 degrees and falling. Shot creek material temperature shall not be less than 50 degrees or higher than 90 degrees. Shot creek shall not be placed against frozen ground or frozen steel.
pool demolition and backfilling. A lot of people want to go out there and get rid of the old pool and put a new pool in. So they go out there and start digging out the old pool. And then they, they go in there with a the device, basically crack the whole thing up, the gunite. Get to the natural soil. Got to compact that soil with jumping jack. 95% standard proctor density. Moisture content plus or minus 2%. Or you can use jumping jack. Run density tests, make sure uh, you're backfilling the pool. It's properly compacted. You got a testament eight inch lifts. Backfill with select structural fill with liquid limit less than 40, PI between 12 and 20, compact 95% standard proctor density. You start putting fill in your pool, you're backfilling it. You put fill in there, select fill. Compact it. Run densities. Forensic engineer, forensic evaluation of pools. We get a lot of calls on pools that are cracked up. They want, we want, they, people want to know what to do. Oh, the reason for pool distress is either bad design, inadequate geotechnical report. 95% of the Pools in Texas, they don't have a soil test. Inadequate structural design, 95% of them don't have proper structural design. We look at construction, materials used, if the gunite is any good, maintenance, trees, drainage, plumbing leak, sewer leak, wear and tear. Inadequate site conditions, if the geotechnical report is not there or does, it's not, doesn't have a pool report, you're going to have to have recommendations on pool design, putting depth, drill putting pool should be founded in expansive soil, should be placed below the active zone, not within the active zone, or movement line, you know, basically the move, movement active zone. Um, um, Recommendations on pool maintenance program, inadequate testing of the soil, incorrectly estimating the PDR values, inadequate information regarding buoyancy forces, in, inadequate information regarding lateral soil loading, not considering the effect of trees. Uh, that's, that's some of the stuff, inadequate geotechnical. Inadequate structural design, not discussing the pool foundations with the client. <laughs> The owner unfamiliar with the proper pool design, pool design without the pool soil report, absence of void boxes, misapplication of design to site conditions. If you got a slope sites, using right wrong type of pool foundation for the soils. Structural design, structural design uh, engineer of the record should have adequate information regarding drainage, slope, existing trees, future trees vegetation prior to the pool foundation design. Inadequate construction, thickness of the gunite. The gunite is supposed to be 12 inches, is only eight inches. There's no steel there or the steel spacing is too big. Or there's too thin of a steel, uh, gunite cover over the steel. We see, see that as well. Inadequate materials, low stream gunite. We see that a lot. Poor quality gunite. You got high water cement ratio. Wear and tear. You got plumbing leak. Poor drainage causes heave and the pool moves out the ground. You go out there and core your gunite. And uh, that's what the gunite looks like. You cap it. You put it in a machine, it's supposed to be 4,000 PSI. It's only 2,000 PSI. ACI 318 says concrete and area presented by core shall be considered structurally adequate. If the average of the three cores 
have at least 85% F prime C and no coal is less than 75% F prime C. So if your gun is supposed to be 4,000 PSI, None of the values should be less than 3,000 PSI. Average of three gunite cores should be bigger than 3,400 PSI. Otherwise, your gunite fails. Petrographic analysis of gunite cores. We take our gunite, get a slice of them, we put them on the microscope. And you go look at it underneath it. The blue dot, the blue areas show air, red circles show sand. The water semen ratio is 0.44, which is okay. Here's another one. The below area is a void in the heart and water. Red circles are sand. The green circles, binding material. Again, here it's got a water semen ratio of 0.44, which is okay. We look for air, chemical attack, like alkyl silica reaction, where the aggregate just pops out. This is a gel here. Alkyl silica reaction is a reaction between certain aggregate types that with cement that cause a gel that causes expansion and pop outs. Non-destructive testing. If you want to know if there's a pool that's got voids underneath it or uh, it's got steel in it or not, uh, you can go in there and use what's called GPR or in this case, a ferroscan. You run it on the gunite, tells you where the steel is and the size of steel, or we use ground penetrating radar that uses an antenna that transmits electromagnetic energy similar to uh, what the cell phones do. A receiver will pick it up. This is uh, basically what this is, looks like. This is a GPR, you run it out there on the pool. You put it on the walls, sides. It's a GPR. It shows a diagram like this. And here it says, green area interacts shallow rebar within the cover with thin cover. The pink area indicates void behind the wall. Here's that the green area show, shows shallow rebar with thin clear cover. Okay, we've well, got a question here. Is an AG not recommended between the pool shell hoping and pool deck? If an AG, I don't know what's AG. Do you address the expand? Oh, expansion joints. Uh, it's not recommended. Uh, I don't know about the expansion joint. You can put isolation joint between the, uh, not, not, not between the pool shell and coping. I would say, you know, uh, you can put expansion joint between the pool shell and coping. Uh, pool deck, definitely you want to put some kind of isolation joint there. So uh, not necessarily expansion joints. Expansion joints are used for shrinking expansion of concrete. If you want to separate things, you put uh, isolation joints in. Pools with block walls. We see these pools going out there and putting retaining walls on it, especially on slopes. They go out there and put these block walls in. You gotta watch out with these block walls. You gotta make sure they're properly designed. We see a lot of failures in here. You cannot put in these strips from the block walls in clay soils or sand. You gotta put it with granule material per the specification of the block wall design manual. We don't want your block walls to fail and the pool starts moving. Pool leak evaluation. If your pool is leaking, it's got cracks in it. You got a leak detection guy out there. They go in and look for cracks to see if there's a leak out there between the 
various uh, parts of the pool. You can dig out there next to the pool and find the plumbing and find the leak. These are the PVC pot that's cracked up. Video inspection. Oh, you want to know if there, there's any kind of a leak from the, like a sanitary line or storm line around the pool. You go in there and you put it in a hole. You look at it on the camera. You see the roots or cracks. Again, you do video observations. You put them in clean out. Look for sanitary lines. You look for places to see if there's any problem. Filling up the whole, the sanitary lines blocked. Pool elevations. You just check the elevation of the pool to see if the pool is moving. You measure the elevations. Plus two five, plus two five, it's a shallow end. Zero, zero, so it's two and a half inches of movement on the pool. Here's another pool, 0 0.5 plus three inches. Plus 2.5. Pool is heaving. You can also do the measurements with water and measure the movement. Water is flat. You can measure the movements on each side of the pool. Hesometer installation for chemical testing of the water of the pool. Sometimes pool leak. And uh, people say the leak causes foundation problem for the house. So you go out there and drill a hole, you put a PVC pipe in there, 12, two inches in diameter, it's perforated, allow the water to flow through it. You put the PVC pipe in a hole next to the pool. You put sand around it to allow the water to travel into the pipe. You measure the water levels. This is your piezometer. There's water in there. You check the water from piezometer. You check it, check it for pH. 7.3, especially a little bit, you know, more than 7.0, slightly alkaline. You check the water pH on the pool and measure the chlorine pH. 7.28, you check the, the pH on the, the water to see if there's a leak from a water faucet or anything or a sink. This is a house, this is the pool. They wanna know if this pool is leaking towards this house. You put the piezometer in the ground over here, you get a water sample of it. So you test the water chemistry. You check for fluoride, tap water, 0 0.6, 0 0.7. We put fluoride in tap water. Swimming pool, 0 0.3, piezometer, 0 0.81. So significant fluorides, not rainwater, it's not pool water. Chlorine, tap water, 1.6, swimming pool, 2.5 to 18, piezometer, less than 0 0.01. Again, not pool water. Uh, total dissolved sol solids, tap water 264, pool 600, piezometer is 944.3. High dissolved solid chlorides and alkalinity, probably leached from soils. So you can check for chloride, check for pH, but tap water was 7.8, swimming pool 7.8, 7.16. So checking the chemical. Chemistry of the water from the pool, piezometer, tap water, you can tell if the pool is leaking. How to fix an uh, auto level pool in uh, expansive soils. This is a pool that's auto level in Tanglewood. You can see this side is coming up. First, you do chemical injection to about nine feet around the pool. So you go out there inside the pool and outside the pool, you do chemical injection to neutralize the, neutralize the expansive soils. So you do the chemical injection to a depth of 10 feet, you drill a hole first. Second, use a polyurethane material to level the pool. After you do the chemical injection, uh, pool leveling using polyurethane, this is the pool, you empty it, 
it's, it's out of level. You empty the pool, then you go in there and use a polyurethane material. These are two different chemicals mixed together at the time of injection. You drill a hole, you put, you put in your, uh, your connection, you inject the polyurethane material, two chemicals. It creates a foam that basically lifts up the pool and fills in the voids. You start lifting the pool and leveling it. This is a polyurethane material. Qualifications of the forensic engineer, expert under investigation, formal education, experience, licensed engineer, active in technical societies. Impartial, truthful, objective, avoid conflict of interest. Must be um, like a detective, someone whose job is to discover information about crimes and find out who's responsible, must be able to think outside the box. You have to be, enjoy digging for truth. Must be a good communicator, report presentations to clients in judicial forms. Pool construction videos. This is a pool out there in friends with that cracked up pieces. And uh, they got a video of construction of it. You can see all the expansive soils. They're shaping the pool. You can see the black gumbo there. The soil becomes tan as you go deeper. This is a floating pool system in highly expansive soils. The pool got cracked up gunite, it's called a level. Lots of heat, cool gunite. The strength was like 2,000 PSI, so 4,000. Pictures, if you got pictures of pools, please send them to me. This presentation is going to be on YouTube, and you can go out there, YouTube, and look at this topic and other topics and send us an email. We can send you a certificate. Uh, program evaluation. We want to know what you all think about this presentation. Uh, please send me an email and tell me uh, what you think of the presentation. If you need to reach me, uh, my email is de at geotechieng.com. Phone number is 713-699-4000. These are upcoming seminars that we're going to have, like June 22, Greater Houston Builder Association, Design Construction, Forensic Evaluation of Residential Foundations. We're going to have another pool presentation for GHBA on July 13th. So we've got a lot of presentations coming up. If you have you guys on our database, you're going to, you're going to get notices. Make sure you send me all your information so that we can put, on, put you on our database. Uh, you're going to get a two-hour PDH hour for this presentation. Okay, man, any questions here? I know there was a lot of information. You may have to go watch it again to kind of pick up on it. But uh, any questions? Well, you all have a great day. There's no questions. We answered the questions during the program. And talk to you soon. We'll see you in the next presentation. Oh, great presentation. Thank you. What would be your recommendation for pile depth and close proximity of the pool? Typically, we'll put piers out there at least 20 feet in Houston. Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin may go up to about 25 feet.
Uh, no questions. Uh, you've improved the presentation. Great job. Thank you, guys.